All right, can you see my screen, the slides? All right, excellent. All right, so uh, for several years now, um, I've been studying the operatic culture in Russia during the reign of Nicholas I, juxtaposing official documents that have lain dormant in the archives with contemporaneous published reviews, I began to notice peculiar patterns. At times, what appeared in the press echoed official documents concerned with matters of cultural policy with such precision that these internal documents must have been the sources. In other words, private newspapers were disseminating official policy to the public. At other times, there were profound discrepancies between the press and the internal documents. For example, when an opera review might extol a singer's vocal and acting abilities, state documents show the Imperial Theater's director's frustration over the same singer's lack of talent and subpar acting. Or when a review talks about operas performed to sold out houses to huge public acclaim, state records reveal that more than two thirds of the seats went unfilled and with audiences disgruntled. Since classified internal records have less reason to lie, the ostensibly objective facts transmitted by opera criticism um, were fictitious. Within the sensorial constraints imposed upon music journalism at this time, such fabrications could only make it into print if officially sanctioned. Published opera criticism then appears to have served to propagate state policy and agenda by means both honest and deliberately misleading. My goals in this paper are three to reveal a direct relationship and alliance really between the state and published opera criticism in Nikolaev and Russia, to explore the political work that opera reviews were meant to do. I will argue that reviews serve to communicate Nicholas's cultural policy, control public opinion of various state initiatives, project a sense of accomplishment and shape expectations and reception of singers and troops, operas, composers, censored librettos, and so forth. And in the process to reassess the nature of historical evidence um, contained in published music criticism from this time, evidence that we still use to tell stories of opera in Russia. I choose to concentrate on the first decade of Nicholas's reign, the decade that set in motion various policy prototypes of, for all matters cultural. And I focus on those reviews that appear in the daily newspaper, the Severne Pchela or the Northern Bee. Um, at this time, this newspaper had a virtual monopoly on opera criticism. And as my case study, I will examine opera reviews connected with Italian opera state venture in the years 1828 to 1831. These reviews offer a cohesive corpus for analyzing the nascent relationship between the state and opera criticism. Music criticism broadly defined was plentiful in Russia before and during Nicholas's reign. In print, one can dissect composer biographies, criticize touring virtuosos, in even in, and even engage in operatic polemics and abstraction. However, opera criticism as a form of theater criticism was strictly prohibited. And this because within the imperial theater system to critique theaters, actors, and singers was to critique the government and its cultural initiatives. By the time Nicholas ascended the throne in 1825, this prohibition had been in place for a whole decade. Reacting to the Decembrist uprising that marred the start of his reign, Nicholas sought to further tighten control over dissemination of information, and he did so by enacting the censorship statute of 1826. Now, despite its remarkable strictness, this statute failed to address theater criticism, neither permitting nor prohibiting it. And so in November of 1826, Nikolai Gretsch and Fide Bulgarin, the editors of the Northern Bee, jumped at this loophole and petitioned the emperor for exclusive permission to write and print theater criticism. In their letter, Gritch and Bulgarin laid the rationale for, the, for lifting the ban as follows. Unbiased and well-intentioned judgment about the stage works presented in theaters and about the acting of actors may bring tangible benefits to the dramatic literature and theater arts, give rise to positive competition among writers and among artists, foster new talent, and channel the taste in judgment of the public 
in a proper direction. Although by and large, these points deal with cultural benefits, the final clause, which I calculated for my talk title, is unabashedly political. This was not the first time, in fact, that the editors of the paper alluded to guiding the masses. Only months earlier, Bulgarian Ingridge already volunteered their paper to serve the state by publishing political news in the form most beneficial to the government. At that time, Bulgarian argued that since it is impossible to quash public opinion, it would be much better for the government to take upon itself the responsibility of guiding and controlling it by means of the press. Reflecting further on the need for theater criticism, in their joint letter, Gretsch and Bulgarian continued. The publication and circulation of opinions and even occasional debates about such innocent entertainment as theater performances might be advantageous to the state in the moral sense as well by occupying the readers with pleasant and non-reprehensible subjects, distracting them from other occupations and thoughts. In the earlier letter about guiding public opinion, referencing the Decemberist uprising, Bulgarian actually attributed the radicalization of youth to state's restriction on theaters, uh, theater criticism. Nicholas was impressed by this proposal and in fact lifted the ban, with his permission then absorbed into the new censorship statute of 1828. It now became legal for any periodical across the empire to write about the theater. Still, theater criticism was censored more than any other form of journalism in Russia. Typically, an opera review would pass through at least five censors uh, before seeing print, um, as you can see from the slide on your screen. With this level of oversight, it became nearly impossible that anything that might contradict official cultural policy would make it into print. Even when review articles originated outside the official network, censorship um, mechanisms ensured that what reached the reading public reflected the political needs. This does not mean that all opera criticism had to do state bidding, but many did, and none more reliably than those in the Northern Bee, the only newspaper that regularly reviewed opera performances. The permission to print opera reviews was granted precisely at the moment of arrival in St. Petersburg of the Italian opera troupe in January of 1828. In fact, the very first ever theater review to be published by the Northern Bee was of Italian opera. And this was no coincidence. As I've argued at this very conference two years ago, the establishment of the Italian troupe in the city was one of the most ambitious projects um, of Nicholas's cultural agenda. And as such, it required active propagation. In the annals of opera in Russia, the Italian company that operated in St. Petersburg in the years 1828 to 1831 remains one of the most misunderstood. In a 1998 study devoted to the prima donna of the Italian troupe, Teresa Melas, Ilya Vinitsky, um, a scholar of Russian literature, constructs two parallel but interrelated narratives, one for Italian opera in St. Petersburg and one for its diva. And he does so primarily by relying on the sources, um, reviews rather published uh, in the Northern Bee. According to Vinitsky, the Italian troupe experienced a huge outpouring of public support, so much so that Vinitsky speaks of Petersburg's obsessive melomania to describe the years of troops' activity. More recently, several musicologists have made similar cases. Problematically, by assuming that the reviews are reliable, these studies are misled by the propaganda of Nicholas's PR machine. Outside published opera criticism, there's almost no evidence that Italian opera garnered public support. In fact, public's disaffection for the troupe was almost immediate. The reports of the secret police reveal that it was constantly criticized and that its singers, two exceptions notwithstanding, were universally disliked. It became obvious early on that the state grossly miscalculated public enthusiasm for Italian opera. The government could not ignore audience discontent. To remain silent was to feed the rumor mill, allowing others to control the narrative. And so over the course of the troops' three-year existence, the Northern Bee devoted some 30 reviews to the troops' performances, tirelessly working on state's behalf to promote the Italian opera by any means. Reviewing the very first performance 
uh, of the troop, the paper rhapsodized. The public was in raptures throughout Rossini's Barber of Seville. Loud plaudits not only followed the singing of each of the three main characters, but even interrupted the singing itself. Complete knowledge of the role and characters, observant of all the norms of the theater and the requirements of the music, and performance with precision of all the notes of the score, the agreeability of the choruses, everything was combined to create complete enchantment. Little of this was actually true, but the rhetorical overkill spilled into subsequent reviews. The opera Cinderella was performed in such a way that the most demanding of connoisseurs were satisfied. Italian opera has taken root in St. Petersburg, and without doubt, the taste for Italian opera will develop in our public, who take the most active interest in its performances. While the public did not take an active interest, the troupe was contractually obligated to sing 210 shows in three years, but already by the sixth performance, the theater was half empty, with steep decline in ticket sales accelerating. The reviews instead continued to try to shape public opinion in the hopes of drawing more crowds to the theater. One might say that the paper was working to simulate Italian opera hype that should have been, but wasn't. The Northern Bee was most methodical in promoting the troops' principal singers, who were, of course, state employees. Often this involved both endowing them with artistic qualities that they did not possess and just as commonly fabricating accounts of positive reception. I could give at least eight examples of this, but one should suffice, that of the troupe's first contralto named Emilia Botticelli. Botticelli made her much anticipated St. Petersburg debut as Arsace in the city's premiere of Rossini's Semiramide. The review by the Northern Bee raved. Before the public, Ms. Botticelli certainly won her case. Her voice, a real contralto, extraordinarily trained, rises and falls with amazing lightness and ease from the highest notes to the bass ones. Her technique is magnificent. The acquisition of this singer could be considered an enrichment of our Italian opera troupe. Not one word of this review was true. That same week, the Imperial Theater's director began to negotiate Botticelli's immediate termination. According to official documents, she was hired without ever being heard, and her Semiramide debut, the one that the paper celebrated, was a disaster. Thus, having become aware of the unreliability of the singer, wrote the director of the Imperial Theaters, the director informed Botticelli of her termination, which she flatly refused, arguing that, quote, based on her contract, she considers herself to be in the service for the three-year period, unquote. After five months of arm twisting, she was handsomely paid off to leave the stage without a scandal. During these negotiations, Botticelli continued to perform with reviews turning progressively more negative. The change in rhetoric mirrored the souring relationship between the state and the singer. Reviewing Botticelli's performance in Rossini's Tancredi, the Northern Bee suddenly had this to say. Ms. Botticelli, who took on the main role, upon first appearing on the stage, got off pitch, started to sing horribly wrong notes, and to rush ahead of the orchestra. The wonderful aria di tanti palpiti, known by heart by everyone who knows any Rossini, was sung by Ms. Botticelli more badly than we could have ever imagined possible. As their compliment, the audience unanimously and collectively hissed at her. Apart from the stark contrast with Botticelli's glowing assessment in Semiramide just one month prior by the very same reviewer, also noteworthy about this review, because it is so unusual, is that it makes a deliberate mention of the negative audience response, something that was never permitted in the press at this time. But in this case, documenting audiences' reaction made it possible for the government to implicitly claim that in terminating Botticelli's contract, it was in effect respecting the audience wishes. Examples in which the reviews capture the changing dynamic between the singer and the state are plentiful, but most of the time reviews simply furnished glowing accounts of singers' abilities, accounts that clash 
with the assessments of the very same vocalists preserved in internal state documents. The question then is, what do these fabrications by the press actually accomplish? The answer, I believe, is contingent on another question. For whom were these reviews written? In one of its opera reviews, the Northern Bee addressed with unusual candor the question of its intended readership. For whom do you write? We might be asked. Well, we answer. First, for the readers of the journal from other towns who readily pay heed to the news and gossip that flies to them from the capital. Secondly, for those good people who go to the theater with an honest intent to kill time without bothering with reflections and who willingly accept explanations of why they found something pleasant and something distasteful, why something is good and something is bad. The first group of readers then resided outside of the capital. For them, reviews offered remote access to the imperial theaters. The newspaper aimed to inform these readers of the cultural accomplishments of the state, and it did so by systematically constructing alternative reality. The second group of to whom the Northern Bee catered was St. Petersburg's middle class, comprising, according to Bulgarin, the service nobility, the well-to-do, but not the very wealthy, along with the gentry, state officials, rich merchants, manufacturers, and part of urban class. This was the same group that the state tried to turn into regular opera goers um, at this time as it expanded its theatrical spectacles. In its reviews, the Northern Bee worked to groom these audiences specifically for opera. In an effort to shape public opinion, opera reviews specialized in spin. Take the immediate audience dislike for the Italian troupe. One reviewer tried to explain to the city, to the city's theater goers that in Italy, one expects from the prima donna certain perfection and talent, that primo amoroso is frequently indifferent and at times even bad, that the first and second buffo do not always have good voices, and by and large, they delight the public with their acting and farces. And as to the, all the other actors, due to their extreme mediocrity, no one pays any attention to them anyway. Well, by such a comparison, the St. Petersburg Italian troupe was actually not that terrible. And in fact, by his own logic, the reviewer concluded by saying that one must be rather partial to not be satisfied with the current Italian troupe. Poor singer choices on the part of the Imperial Theater's directorate also required spin. For instance, in 1830, the directorate hired uh, the once famous Francesca Maffei Festa as the troupe's second contralto. Well, there were two problems. The first one was that she turned out to be a soprano. And the second one is that she was 52 and clearly past her vocal prime. And even though the Northern Bee itself had to admit to being surprised by this hire, the paper managed to put a positive twist on things. The voice of Miss Festa, having lost its freshness, has kept its sonorousness in all signs of previous brilliance. Her technique is marvelous. We think that the acquisition of Miss Festa for our stage is important in several respects, as she was once a leading talent. She could be particularly valuable with her advice and example. Artful actress and excellent musician, she will be the Minerva of our musical Olympus. Poor theater attendance was a particularly thorny issue for the paper, for empty seats signaled the failure of the Imperial Opera project. Although all too often the paper would deceitfully declare that the theater was full, this was unsustainable long term. At first, the Northern Bee tried to rationalize. Um, we try to attribute rather a poor attendance to um, St. Petersburg's um, theater habits. Unlike the audiences in Italy, the paper claims St. Petersburg spectators preferred a melange of short operas rather than one single long work. Moreover, St. Petersburg audiences liked comedy and the Italian troupe at first concentrated on serious operas. Gradually, the Northern Bee began to rationalize the catastrophic attendance situation. The small number of spectators at the theater has its virtues. 
when all of the seats are full, one sees a multitude of people who are apathetic, a multitude of people who have come to theater to kill an evening for five rubles and who interfere in the enjoyment of others. But when the attendance of the theater is connected with some sort of sacrifice, then for the most part, only the most passionate lovers of the theater occupy the seats in the spacious for them auditorium and all these spectators united in one aim comprise a single community. And only in the final weeks of Italian opera uh, in St. Petersburg did the paper openly admit poor attendance, but it now blamed the public for the troops collapse. Sighing over the impending closing of the Italian theaters, Nikolai Gretsch lamented, the Italian opera gave the pleasure to very few. The theater was rarely full and more often it was almost entirely empty. Our public loves everything that's new, unprecedented, give it surprises on long playbills, but the true delight of the fine art went to the light lot of the few music lovers who with their offerings could not sustain the expansive opera company. In blaming the public, the paper was actually deflecting blame from the Imperial Theater's directorate. The same Gretsch wrote, the directorate did not spare expense to establish Italian opera here, but the public did not support it and the opera company could not but collapse. In addition to spin, published reviews also sought to communicate cultural policy to its readers, often preparing the public for changes in policy. For example, with the departure of the Italians imminent, the state began to shift its attention to the German troop, intending to invest substantial resources in improving the German opera company. And so the paper reported, it is said that the Italian opera here will be replaced by the German one. That we, the residents of Petersburg, will soon be savoring the singing of the tenor Heitzinger, Miss Schroeder de Vrien, and other artists only recently delighting the Parisians. The paper warned its readers that this was only quote unquote city rumor. Such rumors originated with the government. At around the same time, the Northern Bee also started to trumpet with much fanfare improvements to the Russian theater troupe. One would read things like this. Generally, public's attention is drawn to the Russian singer, Miss Alexandra Lebedeva. She is endowed with great talent and with the help of art could become an adornment of Russian opera. Behind such announcements stood new state policy. In 1829, in revising the statute governing the theater school, the state made a decision to cultivate professional singers, specifically for Russian opera. The Russian opera troupe would not be created until 1833, but already by 1830, the Northern Bee began to prepare its readers for this policy change. Published opera criticism has always played a role in the historiography of opera in Russia in the first half of the 19th century. Scholars have relied on reviews for factual details about troops and singers, performance practices, day-to-day -day theater operations, and receptions of composers and their works. As I hope to have shown today as a source of objective facts, opera reviews from the years of Nicholas's reign at least are notoriously unreliable. What reviews do document is the state's cultural policy as manifested in opera and as it was quote unquote channeled to the reading public. Such channeling required a collusion of sorts between the state and private press. As we continue to mine published reviews for historical data, I would plead for skepticism and caution in the way we do so. Without thoroughly vetting these accounts, we simply have no way to know what is fact and what is state approved fake news. Thank you. All right. I guess as, a, as the chair of the session, I have to open the floor for questions. So please go ahead, uh, Maria. Thank you very much for a really fascinating uh, survey through all this. Um, very naive question. How specific is all this to Russian culture? And how much of this is happening in other cultures at the um, time and just outside the time as well? I, I think it, at the time, I think it's happening all over the place. Uh, it depends a great deal on the regime 
uh, in power uh, at various places. So for instance, in Vienna, which is the closest in this political system in the 830s and very similar is happening. Um, in Paris, where you know opera criticism is extremely widespread, the situation is very different because a lot of the time um, the newspapers are owned by the publishers of music. And so opera reviews promote whatever is um, useful to the publishers rather than the state. Um, and in Italy, the situation is mixed, depending on which Italian state you're in at that time. Matthew. I, um, I love this project. It's, it, and it must have been uh, a lot of fun to um, uh, wade through some of the rhetorical overstatement of these uh, um, reviews. Um, my question was, oh, how did you, um, what were some of the kind of documents on the other side um, from the um, state archives that you uh, used to confirm the falsity of these um, reviews? What, what was the um, other side of the research? What was that like? So you mean as in not the state documents, not the published reviews, but what other sources have come into play? Oh, no, I, uh, what state documents and and if and if there were other um, uh, documents that you used uh, in the research to 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 confirm the um, you know uh, for instance the empty halls or how certain singers were were uh, received. Yeah. So um, you know there are private letters and diary entries and things like that which do not really enter into the picture unless I could find something because that's the most limited um, kinds of sources. When it came to the state documents, I have concentrated on three collections. Um, archival collections. One is of the third section, the secret police. And so I've looked at some of the actual secret police reports. Um, you know, every time there was an opera performance, there was somebody from the third section in attendance and they would file a report. Um, so I've seen some of those, not many. Um, then there's the, the, the a ministry of the imperial court. So basically it's the, the chancery of Nicholas himself. And the minister of the imperial court was the one that dealt with contracts with singers and also the annual reports from the theater directorate. And so that's another type of source. Um, some of the sources come directly from the records in the, um, in the archives of the imperial theaters themselves. Um, and those come in various um, modes. Um, and types, including the daily attendance books. So there was always somebody in control. In addition to you know the third section spies, if you like, or informers, you also had somebody who was employed by the theater to specifically notate what was happening in the theater from the audience perspective on that evening. Okay, and so they would basically write, okay, attendance was really bad today. You know, the audience was complaining about X, Y, and Z. At least that's, you know, that's what they would report. Or, you know, the singer X sang really poorly this evening, um, that kind of information. And of course, the ticket sales um, records are pretty extensive. Thank you. Anna, please. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, mm, mm, thank you, Daniel, for this wonderful paper and very <laughs> funny in some cases. Um, I agree with you that uh, the policy uh, in regard regarding the Italian troop is uh, related to the to the aims that uh, the the of the courts regarding the Russian one. And, uh, but I would like to ask you, how do you explain then the decision uh, to hire another Italian troop in the, in the early 40s? So which are the factors exerting their influence on the court? And uh, maybe who exactly, uh, what, which individuals exerted their, uh, their influence on the court's decision? What is